One, two, three. Dustin, one, two, three. Bow, wow, wow. Yippee, yo, yippee, yay. Let me know when you can hear and see me. Let's say we good? Good to go. I think we're good to go. Everybody. So one, two, three, testing, one, two, three. Testing, testing. Okay, we're gonna get started. Just fixing something on my audio over here. All right. Welcome everybody to today's stream. Except sorry, I gotta fix something here. Okay. Today, what we are going to be lecturing about is <laughs> Teaching leadership to clients. <laughs> Thank you, Art. <laughs> lead the way. Lead the way, Mike. Art. Right. So yeah, today's today's lecture is on teaching leadership to clients. And this is a very important one. This is actually at the heart of most of our early instruction and and consultations with clients. So this is an important one. So our objectives today are what is leadership and why is it important that we teach it? Is this the same as dominance theory? How does it relate to ethology? How do we teach it? And what are some example guidelines? So first thing is leadership is we wanna know how it relates to our foundation style dog training triangle so if you're relatively new to this this is called foundation style dog training because it's based off of learning things in a certain order which builds a foundation to make it easier to understand and be successful at the next layer and the reason why leadership is right in the center here is because in order to teach it correctly is we we really do need a good solid base first, especially about ethology. We need to understand the natural behavior of canines in order to really be able to teach leadership. And there are other things too, all this comes into play too, even, even attitude, right? Is, is our, our attitude precedes our behavior. So if we know how to go into these lessons with our clients, by having them to create the right attitude for their dog and know that their dog, the things that their dog does or puppy is doing is not because they're being like a jerk. It's just natural behavior. It makes it easier to, to do this lesson and then to look at it from an ethological perspective and to, and, to, and to move forward, right? And we're gonna need leadership. We do need leadership to be successful, as I'll explain, as I'll explain in this lecture, to be successful with troubleshooting most of the hands-on training, which involves things like behavioral problems and 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 training and the actual obedient actual obedience obedience training. All right, so that's why it's there. Um, next is how do we teach leadership? All right, so. The leadership is going to be a major part of our consultation. So I want to give I'm going to give you some tips of how to teach it, and and also we you know I also want to you know give you some tips on um, explaining how this is different from most of the rhetoric that is out there because most people that have a dog especially if they consulted with another trainer or behaviors, they may have misconceptions about leadership or mixed information about leadership. So, so this is gonna be really important. So if we're gonna teach leadership, one of the most important things is before you even do it, is make sure you know your prerequisites, is understand and simplify dominance and leadership because it goes hand in hand from an ethological perspective. So if you want to simplify it, 
and be able to answer questions, the best way to be able to simplify it is to understand it. I did put a link over here um, that goes directly to at least this must be the this is probably the majority of the studies that we have on the site that refer to dominance and leadership. I have a list over here and I really think that this is essential as a high level dog trainer that also is troubleshooting behavioral problems for people is to be an expert in canines natural behavior. So this lists some of the most important studies, the most quoted studies, and I try to find even the most modern studies um, and, and articles. For example, we have this one over here, which I like, which relates directly to what we're talking about today. This was, this was a, an article, a, a published article, The Indispensable Dog, which I've mentioned in another stream. I think I mentioned it in one of the Q and A's, which was published this year. And this is at 2021, which is um, anyone watching the replay, which does explore the, the possibility with lots of references of how important the relationship, basically the dominance and leadership relationship is important in the dog human interaction. So there's really good stuff over here is no understand, read, be well versed on what is out there. You do not just want to be repeating rhetoric. If you are going to be at the top, at the top of your, your profession. So let me see. Art says, um, in my opinion, people's people off the cuff attitude regarding leadership is based off their own personality upbringing and prior dog experience and lack thereof. A macho impatient guy will tend to yank and crank um, alpha attitude while a meek and mild person will tend to let the dog do their own thing, coddling and shy away from the word punishment as something that's always bad. Both extremes define the spectrum along which I think good trainers need to be prepared for in order to help clients. Excellent art. That That's an excellent observation and exactly why you need to know how to really teach this well and to be able to cater to both of those extremes. Because without a solid base of understanding leadership from an educational, ethological point of view, you will hit a lot of roadblocks in uh, in the training. So so understanding first is number one. All right. Then we have to be able to present it to to the owners and and you want to understand how to really address or know that it's there some common mis misconceptions. There are two extremes which relate to arts to arts comment over there, which is um, is we hear dominance theory. And I would say, I called it debunked theory. There's, I would say there's two extremes out there um, that you have to be aware of. One is sort of, I guess we'd call it like an old school dominance theory, which is based off of limited education, basically, um, which is dominance, being dominant, which also, you know, dominant and being the leader kind of, are smushed into one big concept and it has to all be about just being the boss and it's and it's very very crude explanations that you have to be tougher you have to be the alpha you have to be the boss and often this is going to involve being more physical with the dog stronger than the dog more intimidating the dog doing everything everything first so this is like a very very like primitive amateurish sort of um theory of what leadership and dominance about and there's a, and because of that we can get, if someone follows that they can get a lot of potential side effects from being primitive about it right um not really understanding on a deeper level how it actually how it actually works and then there's the other extreme which was really um, emerged as the anti-dominance theory group, which is debunked, which is, I call it the debunked theory. 
which means dominance is just not important. It's it's debunked. It's proven to not be important. It's very and it's a very extreme view that you don't really that it's not relevant to dog training to dog training at all. And if you if you do study dog behavior, you will see that that's also far from the truth. You know, understanding how dogs, which are a social creature, relate to each other is going to be very important as a trainer and not only troubleshooting behavioral issues amongst dogs, which you often have to do, dogs within the same home. Um, it also becomes relevant with um, understanding how dogs relate to us, the humans. So very important. We don't want to just throw out the baby with the, with the bathwater, right? So here are some things that um, misconceptions that you should be ready to discuss. And one is that dominance and leadership is not necessarily just about being the boss, right? Because being the boss, I don't like that term. Someone could be a boss and be a good leader, but being boss, it's just too vague. So someone can really take that out of context and do a lot of things that are going to backfire on them. All right. And, and very, you'll see a lot of places that, that people are going to relate being a leader or being dominant have to do all have to do with being first. All right. With being first, you'll hear you have to eat first. You have to go through the doors first. Um, making dogs move out of your way if they're laying down and you're walking past them don't you know don't walk don't walk around the dogs also doing things like removing food while they're eating just to prove just to prove that you that you can do that you will see that like this simplicity the simple way of looking at it is far from the truth if you study ethology so what you're going to do is you're going to take your information that you learn from ethology and be like all right how can this apply to two people, all right, two people. And when it comes to leadership and teaching leadership, you do, I like to separate it into, into two things. Um, is even though from an, etho an ethological point of view, the dominant canine is generally also the leader, it is two different concepts that you want to teach, all right? Leadership is simply making the decisions for the group, all right? And I like to keep it very, very simple, all right? Leadership is making decisions for the group. Now, if you are the decider, all right? And that's a, even a simpler way to put it, it's just, it's being the decider when things happen. That does not necessarily mean that the human has to do anything first. It does not in any way mean that even in the ethological portion, if you study, it does not mean a wolf leader, a canine leader, whether we're talking about domestic dogs in the studies or if we're talking about wolves, that they have to do everything first. It does not mean they have to be first when they're walking somewhere. It does not necessarily mean that they have to eat first. It does not mean anything like that, all right? but it does mean that you're going to be a decider, right? Some common examples, if you go back and you read Meech's work is, uh, you know, they clearly show, for example, that the parents, the leaders of the pack, which are generally the parents, will usually make sure their puppies eat first, right? And they will even, there's documented cases of the alpha male, all right, or breeding, breeding male, whatever we want to call them, um, capturing hares, right, and delivering them to his yearlings, you know, pretty much like young adult other wolves in the pack and letting them eat first. They are the providers. They are making decisions for the benefit of the whole group. So it is much more complex than just doing things first, right? And often if we are preaching well you don't want to preach doing things first because not only will it be unnecessary 
it can cause relationship issues. It can cause frustration with the owner. It could make a not enjoyable experience with their dog. If they're always worrying about they have to do something, they have to do things first, they have to go through the doors first, they have to eat first. It is just not, it is not necessary and it does not reflect. There are no, there's no scientific documentation out there anyway that supports that it has anything to do um, to has anything to do with being first, right? Um, next thing too, um, with dominance theory, which is it's usually referred to, is that um, it also you're going to hear common things that if the dog challenges you or a puppy challenges you, you hold it down and dominate it and alpha roll it and stuff like that. Again, I can tell you from many, many, many years of experience and consulting with many other trainers that are working with the highest level aggression cases that you never have to physically, physically manhandle a dog to become the leader, all right? It is more likely just because some people can overpower certain dogs it does not in any way mean that it's the dog recognizes it, that the person is now their leader any more than you take a wild animal and you sit on top of it and try to hold it down until it, until it gives up, right? It's, it's just, it does not have anything to do with it. And from an ethological point of view, it is generally dogs alpha role for each other, generally, all right? They give up on their own, they offer, um, they, you know, they're, they're, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to offer submission to other dogs. It does not mean that dogs do not get into fights and they have contests and that it results sometimes in, in alpha roles, but that does not, there's, it, I can tell you from experience that it is not necessary any more than you need to lift your leg and start peeing, peeing in your house to claim it, to claim it as yours. And you do not want to encourage any clients to do anything that can potentially get them injured. All right. So even if you are a big, tough trainer, you do not want to do anything that another trainer is not going to be able to do. All right. And also, like I said, it is not necessary. You will see that there are better ways. To, to do it, all right? <laughs> yeah, and Kimberly says, yeah, I'm not alpha rolling my 90 pound plus male. Yes, and and the best trainers out there that are most successful, like, um, yeah, you, you cannot be successful relying on alpha rolling, alpha rolling animals. And, and I see many trainers, a lot of the most successful trainers that I know of, they're physically, Physically, they they just wouldn't be able to with the majority of the animals, and they don't need to, and that's why they're more successful. They're not dealing with all the side effects from it. The trainers that I see that get bitten the most, injured, sent to the emergency room, and have a highest failure rate are definitely the trainers that try to be primitive and are not educated and just think that leadership is about physically, physically dominating, all right? Now, for our purposes of, of teaching leadership is, is to break down leadership into, yes, it's being the decider for the group and dominance is just simply control and limited resources, all right? So if you just make it simple for the clients and be like, there are these misconceptions that it's, it is not about just being first and it is not about being tough, tough and physically dominating the dog or being intimidating or using a deep voice or anything like that. Leadership from a scientific point of view is just making the decisions for the group. Dominance is being in control of limited resources. If you keep it simple like that for a client, it makes it easy for them to understand, easy for them to, to apply, and it makes it easier to, to start the, the training. So, so I tell them when I use those words, that's, that's what I mean. And that reflects what we see in the scientific, in the scientific studies. All right. So, um, so the easiest way to, to teach leadership now is I always stress, whoops, I wrote two points here. It's really three points. All right. Um, 
is I stress on three points, all right? One I already went over is, is that leadership is gonna be important from an ethological point of view um, because it makes sense to the dog. And this is so easy if you just, I like to use analogies. It's um, if you read scientific research, canines you know and dogs are very similar to humans they have their obvious differences but one of the reasons that we have been, that we have lived side by side for dogs since before way before written history is that we're very very similar and they live in family units right it's natural for them to be in a family in in, in a family unit. So think of leadership and dominance in the same way that we do with children, all right? We don't have to, in order to prove that we're leading children, generally you don't have to be beating them up and manhandling them um, every, every single day, all right? Or, or, or at all for that, for, that, for, for that matter, all right? It's deciding when things are gonna happen, all right? Leadership is deciding when they're going to bed at night, when they're going to eat their eat eat their meals, when they're going to go to school, when they're going to do their do their homework. Is when they're raised and they live life in that way, it's much easier for those children to be to be successful. And it is natural, it is natural for children to look for leaders when they are young, when they are new, just like when someone gets a new puppy and even when someone brings even an adult dog into the home, all right? It is much easier to communicate something to that dog that they understand that is natural to them because if you study ethology, that's the way that it works, all right? The young canines generally do not have to make any major decisions, all right? So, so, so stress that this is, a, you know, from an ethology point of view, that this is just natural take a load off their shoulders because said it's much easier than you would think, right? If you know how children should ideally be raised, um, you should know the basics of how dogs should be raised inside of a home. And then also that dominance, right? That dominance is going to be just like with children is we control the resources, all right? We don't let them necessarily go and eat as much ice cream as they want inside of the freezer. We're controlling it. We control, we, prop, we perhaps even control certain toys or video games, how much they're allowed to have it. We control even the food on other, other levels where we don't allow them to necessarily steal the food off of their siblings' plates or their siblings' toys. We're controlling things, right? We're controlling limited resources. We're deciding when things are happening. Like, make it simple for the clients, all right? Don't, you don't have to quote all the scientific studies, but reassure them that this is based off of this and you have, res you have the sources if they need it. You know, you do get those clients that love to dive in, in uh, deep. And another thing, I should have even mentioned it on this whole dominance, you know, theory thing, the same thing is um, when it comes to even like growling at food, when you get puppies that are growling when you give them food and things like that. This too has nothing really to do with dominance, that's resource guarding, right? Which we go into an ethology, which we deal with in a different way. It does not mean a puppy is trying to be a boss or even a dog is being a boss. That's a natural behavior to guard what they have because that's a natural behavior that you will see puppies do to adult dogs. You'll see wolf puppies do it even to the alpha wolves and it does not necessarily mean anything, all right? So all this stuff usually in the consultations, you're going to consult consult with the with with the owners and then we deal with it appropriately with the with the right plan, all right? So the three points, that's a typo there, all right? Ethological point of view. The next is the teaching point of view. This is why we do this early. It's from a teaching point of view, it is going to be easier to motivate the dogs, all right? So if the dogs have basically free access to everything and we're and they're doing basically whatever they want, all right? They're leading sometimes where where they're telling us 
when they want to play or when they, when they want to when they want to be pet or when they want to eat dinner or whatever it becomes more difficult for them for the owner to be able to train their dog right if we're controlling things and again this is nice and common sense things that's easy to communicate to the owner all right and from from a behavioral point of view we call that establishing operations right anything that we need to motivate these dogs that we're training we can make it more powerful if we control it right Establishing operations are things we do to make motivators more powerful and controlling these things naturally gives us the ability to make these things more powerful where the dogs just can't get it for anything all right if not a lot of clients are doing what's called abolishing operations meaning um they by not paying attention to leadership and dominance they may be giving their dogs free access to a lot of things that make it less motivational to the dog now if they're going to use it as part of the training plan all right so that's called establishing i mean abolishing operations what we want to do is establish establish operations third point is um from a troubleshooting point of view easy it's going to be easier to troubleshoot behavioral problems if the owners um, get on board with showing leadership and dominance because that's when we can which we're going to go into i'm going to do an updated stream on the habitation charts is once everything is controlled and we make sure they are they are micromanaging their dog and tell them when they're going to be doing things that helps fulfill their their basic needs we can start chart we could start actually charting it and it makes it easier to see um when behavior problems occur what potentially triggers behavioral problems it helps us to find replacement behaviors what things are not working but a prerequisite to do in a habitation chart is to be able to is to be able to um is to, to to understand leadership and what the dog's needs are and how to provide for it so those are really the three points now easy way to teach it is I always like to draw out a little chart. Sometimes I print out a chart. Sometimes I will draw a chart on a board, depending where I am, if I'm in a group class, or if, even if it's doing a private lesson, I have access to a whiteboard. If you're doing um, an online consultation, you could use a pre-made chart like, like uh, this. Um, so, so I like to do a basic need chart where what I do is I highlight five different things, all right? And usually if you address these five different things, you have lots of things to talk about with the owner and to start helping them understand leadership and how to apply, um, apply a plan, right? So I go over affection, play, slash work, food, rest in areas, and outdoor access with them all right now often what i would do so easy right if you have like a whiteboard or something on you is um i may even just draw one really quick so you don't have to write all the stuff that's out that's on the chart there i might just write provided all right unprovided and um entitled all right I think I'm blocking it. And then what I'll do is I'll put over here each of the categories, say affection, and I'll ask them a few questions. And then after they answer the question, I'll say like, okay, it sounds like your dog may be in the entitled category, all right? And then if we talk about play, um, you know, for that one, I may say, okay, that one looks like you're providing for, okay? Um, and then if we're talking about um, something else, like say outdoor access, and you know they have a puppy and the dog is not getting out enough times and it's having accidents around the house. And you can just see from their information that it's not even, it's not even getting out enough in order to be successful. We might put that, you know, un unprovided for. And that's how, that's how we generally do these charts. And it starts the discussion with um with the owners 
Now, the reason why I focused on, the, on these five things is that it actually coincides with um, a lot of natural behavior when it comes to, when it comes to canines, about, uh, you know, about leadership. Like, for example, something like play, um, play or activities, which is something that fulfills their drive. This relates a lot to natural behavior canines. Like in this case, here's some wolves hunting, right? Like they do have these instincts. A lot of dogs, you know, we domesticate them. We exploited their predatory behaviors mostly. So that's why a lot of them would play. They like to chase after things or bite and pull on tugs or whatever. And generally it is the leaders of the pack that decide, okay, we're going to go out and start a hunt, right? And so this relates to ethology. Things like this, um, here goes a, a wolf that is guarding, you know, guarding his food, which would, which would be considered, you know, resource guarding, but controlling the food and actually who's allowed to have it and when, not necessarily the act of guarding the food, is something that is that is a job of the leaders inside of the pack generally generally the parents this is another one that people don't really think about these are actually photos of some some um, stray dogs which i believe these photos were taken from um ray coppinger some work from ray coppinger when he was studying um some some stray stray dogs it shows that Rest in, play, pay, uh, rest in places people take for granted that these are very important to canines too. When you're outside in the elements, often when there's limited rest in areas, um, it can mean life or death. It can mean overheating. It can mean being being cold. It can mean being you know laying somewhere that's that's uh, wet. So rest in areas are important to to canines. You have to remember that. And of course, this is, these photos are kind of kind of small here, but um, travel in general. So things like taking the dog out for a walk, going to the park, stuff like that. With wolf packs, it is a misconception that it's always the alpha that's out front. That's not really true, right? It's really about, you know, the leader, the leader of the pack generally decides which direction they're going. Um, can break direction. There's studies that show nothing is 100% consistent, right? They could take suggestions from other wolves. They're not, nothing is really set in stone. But in general, um, canines, whoever is leading, decides the direction. So not a big deal. Definitely not a big deal if you're out hiking with your dog and the dog is out front when you're hiking in a trail, right? As long as you're deciding the general direction and you want to go left and he wants to go right, you go the direction that you want to go, all right? So these are an affection too, all right? And this is all well well documented as far as um, interaction, when interaction is allowed, is it's going to be the leader that's generally in control of that. And of course, uh, of course, play, all right? Which all canines seem to seem to play and and enjoy and enjoy playing. So it's so it is related, you know, it's related to, to that or to that photos from Coppinger. What is a dog? Great, great, great book. All right. So I like to go over these now. Affection. Affection is number one. Very, very important that when you ask these questions, you do not put the owners on on the defense. And as you do, depending on how you set up your consultation, I often gather this information before I even let them know that I'm putting their dog into a category, all right? You ask nice laid back questions like, is your dog affectionate, all right? Can you explain what happens when your dog wants affection? Does your dog come ask for affection? Um, does your dog not really like affection? Does your dog move away from you? If you go to pet the dog, is gather information, all right? What we're really looking for here is, um, is ideally we want a dog that when the owner calls the dog over, willingly comes over and eats up the affection, all right? If, and we call that provided for, all right? We call that provided for. We want to shoot for owners that know how to provide affection to the dog and give enough of it 
um, give enough of it for the dog so the dog f um, feels, feels fulfilled. But not so much affection that the dog, we, we, get, we get the impression that the dog is just entitled. And that would be if the dog on its own fulfills it due to free access, all right? So provided for is when the owner fulfills at, the init at their own initiative and schedule on anything. Entitled is when the dog fulfills it due to free access and by soliciting, all right? That's the main difference between that. And it's okay to be careful. I actually had a, because um, I am really, really sensitive to you don't ever want your clients to like put their guard up and think in any way you're blaming them for being a, a bad owner or their dog from being like a bad a bad dog you always have to put them at ease that you're finding information and that you're trying to help them so i even had i even had one of the trainers on here um, um told me a good point it's like you might even want to be careful calling their dog entitled right you may not even want to use that word and just say do you provide for the dog you know from your from your own initiative or does the dog provide for itself have free access so you can even be careful with the words that you say so now if the owner has a dog that mostly comes over and just gets affection when it wants and this is normal right people do this all the time i would say most average people fit into this category with their dogs the dog is in the mood for affection comes over lays their head on the owner's lap and the the owner pets the dog, right? It's not a crime. It's not a big deal. They love their dog, right? The dog wants it too. Does not necessarily mean the dog's trying to dominate anyone, right? It's just the dog wants affection and that's just how it was raised, right? It knows I'm, I feel the need for affection. I want to get affection. The owner gets it, right? So we call that entitled or free access, but we want to troubleshoot that. We want to know, mark that on the chart, all right? And that's going to serve, like I said, from different, you know, for different reasons, all right? From, a, from, an etho from an ethological point of view, we want the dog to see that we want that position to lead, all right? If we are leading, we do not just allow the dogs to get it whenever they want, um, but we want to provide, all right? Because if we provide, they will get as much as they want because we make sure we offer it, all right? We offer it often. You're gonna see the same thing with food, right? With food. If a dog has free access to food or there's no sense that they have to, that the owner is actually providing for it and it's just not in tight, they're either just, it's just always there or they're barking and the owner gives it, right? Is um, that would be entitled. But if it's provided for, that means the owner knows how many calories the dog needs, um, the dog is never gonna go hungry. It's just like a kid. They know they're gonna get probably their breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and maybe even some snacks, right? The owner should know what feed schedule the, their particular dog is on for the amount of calories they need, and they're gonna provide either meals at certain times or food during training sessions or snacks, but it's on the owner's call. And the dog should have a sense of that. And that is what the provided for is, all right? It's very easy to be able to have this make sense to the owners when you start looking at this way. Same thing with play or work, depending on what someone's doing with the dog, right? Um, something like someone that goes hunting with their dog, right? We'd probably call that work. Um, but if someone is doing something like throwing around a ball for a dog, we would refer to that as play, but it all fits into the same category. This is something that fulfills their work and drive either way, whether it's through play or it's still work. And it's the same thing here. He's like, do we have a dog that generally has toys or a ball, you know, um, balls laying around and they fulfill, they, fu they, they know how to fulfill themselves by bringing the toys to the owner, soliciting the owner to do it. Then the owner starts playing with them. Um, um, or does the owner schedule it? Does the owner know, okay, I have this dog. He has a strong work and drive, just like I'm scheduling the meals. Let me make sure that I schedule during the day times where we're going to play and they're in control 
you know, their control of whatever the outlet is that the dog needs and, um, and they make sure that they do it. Okay. And the same, th same thing with food. We mentioned the food resting places. All right. Does the dog just rest wherever it wants the beds, the couches, the, the same places that the kids are, are, are laying around Does is the dog have any sense at all that, um, that the rest in places are controlled by the humans in the household. All right. Um, or does the owner make sure they provide something that's comfortable for the dog, right? Is the owner giving the dog a particularly place that's soft and comfortable that the dog can, can relax? Is it something that's provided for? And the next one, excuse me, is um, outdoor access. Um, but this is really travel in general. I wrote outdoor access because mostly with pet people, this is what we're dealing with is how do these dogs get access to go to outside? Generally to go to the bathroom, right? But this could be anything, go for a walk, um, go on the backyard to play. If you have a dog that say barks at the owner to go outside, scratches at the door, even rings a bell, which is a cool little trick. Technically, if the dog is sort of deciding okay let me outside now i'm gonna go this way or barks at the owner to take him for the walk to remind him for the walk if this is the habit like if this is what the normal daily routine we have a dog too that's really left um with mixed signals from the from the owner compared to if the owner knows about how often the dog needs to go outside to go for a walk or whatever and has the dog basically on a schedule all right so this is how we compare provided for entitled and we're really looking for with most of the owners with all the owners really that we put them all we have them understand the provided category because in order to do this um it really sets us up for success when we start to move into the training and working on behavioral problems. Now we have this other extreme over here, which is unprovided for. This is where you also have to troubleshoot where sometimes the dog is just not getting enough of any of it. Like you can have a dog that just does not get, um, just does not get enough affection, um, whether it's provided for or they come and get it which could lead to potential issues and detachment and stuff like that. You can get a dog that's neither being provided with enough work um, or play, um, whether the owner is providing for it and is participating or they're doing it in an appropriate way on their own, which could cause all types of potential issues, chewing things up and everything. Food, same thing, right? We can, a dog can not be getting enough cow calories and is spending a lot of time trying to dig in the garbage or or stealing food it, it could add to potential issues over there not to mention mention health issues same thing rest in places right we have a dog that may not be allowed on the furniture but also doesn't even have a nice soft dog bed on the floor so then again they're more prone to be um to trying to seek out and fulfill this need for an appropriate place to rest on their own, causing it to have problems. And same thing with outdoor access, right? So obviously kind of talk of house breaking issues and stuff like that. But this is really good starting point um, for, for leadership. And of course, I'm not gonna read off everything I put in here. It's just suggestions, you know, like the type of issues that the dogs potentially can have, um, whether they're entitled and unprovided for, and of course provided for, sets the sets the stage for pretty much everything. And I love making this chart with the owners and starting the conversation with them. And it's essential for for especially dogs with higher drives, working type dogs, and dogs with stronger personalities that are going to have a tendency for more dominant type behavior when they when they get older all right so so you're dealing with with two types of clients really ones that have a new dog that they want to do everything right with and then you have owners that have 
different degrees of active issues that they're dealing with. Sometimes like mild to moderate issues, sometimes severe issues like aggression towards aggression toward, towards the owners. And the leadership, it works, leadership exercise work, works as a preventative and it also works as a treatment to at least stop feeding the, the heart or the source of a lot of the, the, the behavioral problems that we were dealing with in the first place. So we don't wanna feed the beast of what the behavioral problem is. And, and to give you some, some really quick examples over here, if I said we could, we could sit here for hours just to talk about how these could lead into issues, right? Is let's say we have a dog that um, genetically really, really gets, um, is attached to the owner and likes to follow around the owner. Like a lot of the shepherd breeds, for example, are really, really prone to this. Um, and love affection, love to be pet and stuff like that. Um, and they just get all the affection that they want all the time. We're constantly on the owner's laps, constantly getting pet, 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 pet. They are, you can, and now suddenly the owner's in the other room, sometimes even in the other room and the dog cannot reach the owner because um, for various reasons and the dog is having like a hissy fit or having separation anxiety or is barking its head off, right? Um, um, the more they're just entitled to and they're used to something, it's harder for them to, to go without it when they're used to getting their fix, whatever they want. This could also lead to potential aggression problems with certain dogs, right? If you have a dog with a stronger personality and they're used to getting affection, whatever they want, whenever they want, they can also decide that they have so much that they're not in the mood for it and will show aggression towards the owners, right? When then the owners try to pet them, when the owner's in, inside of the mood, and not when the when the owner's in, in, the, in the mood. You will also get dogs that will show aggression because their owner is not petting them as, as they get older, right? So that's that's just an example, all right? So, so and just a lot of bossy behavior in general, all right? Where bossy, Always be careful, all right, when you're dealing with the clients. Things like bossy behavior, it is what it is, all right? Dogs learn exactly what we teach them, all right? If they learned to be content by soliciting and being a self-advocate for themselves, when suddenly the situation has changed where the owner has guests over, they can't give the dog attention, the dog only does exactly what we taught them, all right? Dogs do exactly what we taught them. It's not their fault, all right? So we got to help the owners and their dogs to create an environment where they're both happy, all right? And that's what Sinopraxis is about, right? Because this is all about Sinopraxis, right? Training should make the owner's life better and the dog's life better together and improve their relationship. You'll see if you skimp on one or the other, the training is not as successful, all right? Training is not, is, is not, is not, not successful. Um, yeah, Kimberly says the owner obeys more commands than the dog. Dominant established by um, consistent leadership. Yeah. yeah, so dogs train, dogs really do. People don't realize it. Dogs end up training the owners often when someone doesn't really, pay attention to it. A lot of first time dog owners, so, um, they get, often the dogs train the owners, right? Like I said, they're not trying to do, they're the dogs are just trying to be fulfilled, have their basic needs met. And and a person would do the same thing, right? If no one, if, if no one gave, you know, if a, if a parent never gave a child a consistent meal, you're gonna have, you're gonna have a child asking more, all right? Can I have something to eat? or going into a refrigerator and grabbing something inappropriate to eat on their own, right? They do, they do, all the behaviors are explainable, right? We have, a, I, I use this analogy with, with um, dog owners all the time, is suppose you have a child that really loves art, right? Really loves drawing, really loves art, but you don't have any paper. You never have any paper. You don't do anything. Um, for the for the kid, these little kids, they, they draw on the walls, right? They may draw on the walls, they may, even as teenagers, they may go out and do graffiti outside. But if you put them in an art class, you give them an outlet, you give them stuff to, to draw on, um, 
you'd be surprised, you know, the trouble they're not going to get into. And actually, you can see the potential, right? You could see the potential of the kid. It's very, very similar. I mean, like, like stressing the similarities between us and them is the way to go. When I first started training, it was everyone, all my original mentors were telling me, don't anthropomorphize dogs, right? Don't put human-like characteristics onto dogs. And to a degree, that is true, right? Like certain things with spite, like dogs aren't necessarily like spiteful and things like this. And, and um, But with other things, you cannot forget that they're more, I would say, in my opinion, they're more similar to us than, than different. So it's good to stress that point. Like, no, they're not humans. And, and there are certain things that we don't want to put human type characteristics um, upon them, especially when it comes to things like being spiteful and, they, and you know, and things like that. Like they're, they don't really have that type of nature. Right. Um, um, but other things are very, very similar to us as far as needing leadership, needing to be provided for, feeling comfortable. They like to, the average dog does not like to have a lot of responsibility in fulfilling their own needs. They want to be provided for. Um, they really do want to want to be pro, pro, provided for. Um, Kimberly saying, are they using the quadrants when tra training their human? Yeah, <laughs> in a lot of cases they do. I was talking about operant conditioning. Um, I would say yes. I never really thought about that, right? But but if you have a dog that is used to used to being raised a certain way, um, I say you can have they can have too little or too much of something. So let's take something like um, let's take something like affection, right? Um, I would say they will ask the owner for affection, all right, and then the owner gives them affection, and they're wagging their tail. I would say. I would say it's positive reinforcement for the owner, right? Um, when the dog comes over and they're and they're and they're asking for it, and they and they obey the dog, that they're going to be rewarded with this love. But you can also have a dog then too, when the owner goes to pet the dog, and now the dog isn't in the mood because it's used to being in control of the relationship. Now the dog growls; it doesn't want to be pet. We're talking positive punishment now, right? The owner stops petting the dog, the ground goes away, that's negative reinforcement. So it, it, it makes sense. Dogs could do it too, you know, because remember, operant conditioning, just like classical conditioning, it's a rule of nature, right? No one needs to understand the terms. Those terms are just there to put labels on something that exists for all animals, all right? Whether they, they know technically what it is or not. So, so, so yes, definitely. Um, now, Leadership guidelines. Um, wait, do oh, here we go. Do the clients have have to follow leadership guidelines? Like once I've noticed this is true. Like once I learned the importance of leadership and how it makes training so much easier. A I went through. I went through a phase where I was like the ultimate stickler. Where like I demanded all owners like. Don't let your dogs on the furniture or on the beds. No, don't don't free feed at this time. Oh, the dog came over and asked for affection and you gave it to them. And is I was a stickler um, when I first when it first came together to me is how important this was. All right. The reason why is because I think every trainer, after you get so many cases underneath your belt and you're taking a good history, you will see trends. You will see, you'll have your research, you'll have your education. Then you will see people that have bad behavioral problems. And then when you start taking a history, without a doubt, you will see, oh, the owners with the dogs with the worst behavioral problems have the dogs that are the most entitled and unprovided for. In some ways, I would say, the entitled ones can almost have worse issues because those are those a lot of times the dogs that are very, very entitled and have the temperament type together, right? It takes two. It's nature versus nurture. We'll have 
some of the most serious behavioral problems. So then when you work with the new client, even if they don't have a major issue, you're like, oh my God, I have this information that's so important, you have to do it, all right? And you're demanding it, you're getting like angry at them if they don't do it because they're not taking you seriously. Um, and you don't want something to happen and you don't wanna say like, oh, I told you that was gonna happen, I told you so, all right? So I went through a phase where I was like a real, real, real stickler. Now, from a professional point of view, again, you gotta be careful, all right? Um, you have to make sure you keep a base of sinopraxis, right? We're there to make the dog and the person's life more enjoyable together, all right? That's the common denominator. Now, what I found out, this is, this is advice, all right, is leadership exercises are good for all dogs, without a doubt. A dog is only as good, it's training is only as good as the handler, only as good as the owner. But that being said, is some owners do not care about having the perfect dog. They just want to mostly enjoy the dog. So if you get an owner, for example, that bought a dog specifically to be a lap dog, they enjoy having the dog on their lap while they watch their movies at night. And the dog is not exhibiting, if you evaluate that dog's temperament and you see the dog does not have a very strong temperament or is not prone to behaviors that would be high risk for the owners wanting to get rid of the dog or make the owner miserable or something like that, they're there because they just they want a better recall or they want a better, you know, there's something else going on. They're having a house breaking issue. It is okay. I always, always, my opinion is I teach leadership exercises. I say, I tell them it's the way that they can get the most from their dog for all the obvious reasons, all right? The dogs are gonna be prone to less behavior problems. Often owners have problems with their dog that you would, would be a problem for you. You'd be like, oh, I, I can't believe that they deal with it, all right? Whenever they're eating dinner, a dog is sitting there barking at them and they shut the dog up by giving the dog a piece of chicken. And I would never do that, all right? And, but if it's not a problem, behavior problem from a professional point of view, when you're dealing with the client, this is my advice. A behavior problem is considered a problem when it's a problem for the owner, all right? Does that make sense, okay? So we, I try not to project what I would do, what, what I would prefer with my own dog onto, onto the owner. But I do my job in part always of saying, this is the ideal way, so you know, all right? You gotta cover your bases. But if the owners are happy and you're solving a problem for them, whether it creates the perfect dog or not, if you're solving a problem and they're happy and the dog is happy, Remember, you've done your job. Now, but you also have to know where to sort of draw the line, all right? Where sometimes you're gonna run into cases where um, there's a lot of different reasons where you do want to um, push or sometimes um, not only push, require that they follow leadership guidelines. I'll give you an example. Is if we are dealing with a dog that is um, showing aggression towards the owner or potential aggression towards the owner. And especially if they have hired you to do high level obedience, that desire, you know, where the dog is going to need control, all right? Control where you may be, where you're using corrective collars, um, aversive, stuff like that. Um, this is where you could, where you, where I think it is, okay and often often the responsible thing to draw the line the reason why is from an ethological point of view we know that if a dog feels if they're unsure who is leading and actually if they become adults and they have been used to leading and they see their owner as mostly a follower towards them you will have a dog that not only um, could potentially 
correct, do normal behavior of correcting the owner's behavior of trying to serve a role that they do not have. It would be normal dog behavior. You can also cause a dog, if we're talking about being Lima, all right, which is a prerequisite, which is down in, in the ethics part of foundation style dog training. If we want the owner to use the least amount of aversion possible is um, if the dog cannot be motivated easily, if the dog gets whatever it wants all the time, it is more likely if they're going to be training, if we're dealing with like e-collars or prong collars and stuff like that, and there's no control on the limited resources, there's no, like I say, it, the dog is more likely to get a lot more aversives if the dog cannot be motivated easily to do things because the owner has established operation, has been controlling the affection, controlling the food, controlling all these kind of things, all right? So it could cause all kinds of problems, all right? So you as a trainer, you have to make those judgment calls, but try to draw the line, especially when it comes to things like, I think everyone should draw the line and it can be considered negligent if someone does not want to follow leadership exercises, is doing everything opposite, and they one of their they have a they have an issue where the dog can potentially show aggression towards them because of ethological reasons, right? Where where from an ethology point of view, the the canine is the one that is leading is considered dominant is does have the right to discipline okay it does not mean and if you study canines generally do not have to discipline each other when they're in a leadership position all right they're generally just posturing and stuff like that dogs are not killing each other within packs there's usually a serious issue if that ends up happening you get aggression you get injuries when there's conflict all right when there's conflict, when they're unsure, when they don't know who is leading, all right? So you don't want a dog that's leading um, majority of the time or half the time and is confused having conflict with an owner, you're much more likely now to have headbutting between the owner and, uh, and the dog. So it's something, to, it's something to consider there. Let's see, um, I, see some, I see some chatter over here. Um, I see Art says, I read somewhere that vets have an acronym for dogs smarter than owner. They put it on their record. Um, Kimberly says, their behavior has been reinforced for, for so long. Yeah. Art says, in my opinion, there's a potential issue with making concessions to owners regarding behavioral issues. I mean, if owners are letting their dog, even a submissive one, have run of the house, that will impact behavior outside. Fear, aggression, unleash leash pulling because owner has to be stronger leader outside to compensate for the under lack of leadership issues indoor. Yes, um, great point, all right? Stress to the owners, like it depends on what the owners wanna do, right? Even though a dog that's naturally more submissive, right? I use the terms, a lot of trainers use the term submissive secure and dominant secure, meaning when they're left in a situation where there's no clear leadership, some dogs will naturally just look for leadership. I mean, whoever wants to lead, just lead, all right? Um, even those very submissive dogs, those are the dogs that people owned. You get the clients and they say, but I've had this dog and I've had dogs my whole life and I never had these issues, all right? And they were doing everything entitled usually. And they didn't have any major issues besides a dog that probably just did not have any type of impressive training, all right? Was not the most obedient or stuff like that. Wasn't that motivated. Um, those are usually like, those are usually fall in the category of submissive secure dogs, but you see it more and more, um, now that like working breeds are becoming more popular and the guardian breeds, you, you see a lot more, we call it dominant secure dogs that especially as they get older, if things were not clear to them, they just decide to take the lead, right? All right. No one's going to lead here. I'm going to take the lead. Um, and they were not designed to be that way, right? They were designed to have stronger temperaments, 
usually because they had to stand up to big tough things as, mm -hmm. as guardian breeds and sometimes some of the fighting breeds and stuff like that. Um, but they were never designed to lead the human who was in charge of them, right? And that's why that's some of the the most uh, the worst injuries you see dogs against humans are often some of the stronger temperament dogs against their own owners are usually the most uh, horrific when you hear people being killed by dogs and stuff like that you'll be surprised how many is the dog doing it against their own owner and when you when you troubleshoot when you really dig into the details even though it's often classified as unprovoked because the average person is not really understand the details of um, canine behavior especially how it relates to humans when you dig into the details often what you will find was a dominance conflict of some sort that triggered it um, fear aggression and things like that are much easier to recognize when a dog is just showing aggression towards people that they that they don't know so so you want to you know you want to take that into consideration for sure um, Kimberly says this can be a problem in multiple dog households, allowing a dog to be leader. Yes, um, the and you'll see this is without getting too deep into how to how to fix you know all behavioral issues because this is a base for all behavioral issues. So so once we go into like blueprints for different behavioral problems, you'll see leadership is the base for all of them. Pretty much any behavior problem, like major behavior problem. Leadership is the base, right? It, it sets the stage. That's why it's the heart of the triangle. It sets the stage for all the hands-on stuff that we're gonna do that's gonna balance out the dog and the relationship with the, with the humans in the family, but also including with other dogs in the house too, because um, if, they're in, if they're under supervision of someone they consider a leader, it makes sense to them that the leaders decide who's allowed to have conflict within the house, right? Just like a parent does not allow their children to kill each other. Um, the same way dogs understand that they're not allowed to show aggression to other canines, even in the household, if they're within the presence of someone who's in a leadership position. And that's generally the heart of how you solve issues dog on dog um, aggression issues within the house, right? They don't fight for no reason. Usually, usually you'll find out, right, that they're fighting over things related to this. They're fighting over control over limited resources, the owner's affection, um, rest in places, um, who gets to do what first, who's making, the, who's making the decisions about interacting with each other, even decisions about, um, barking at the fence who's who's making the you know who's making the decision that we're supposed to be aggressive now or not be aggressive and it's all usually those dog on dog aggression issues related in the house are always related to leadership and dominance conflict where they're where they're unsure and we the the first part to solving it is understanding it right is is us putting ourselves um, in that position, right? And putting ourselves or the owner in that position involves first cutting off any, any communication that we're given to the dog that reinforces, that reinforces their misconception that either, um, that either we do not care about the position or sometimes that we're outright reinforcing their, their position, right? There's all kinds of extremes there, but that's the first step, right? Leadership, understanding leadership and even practicing these things doesn't necessarily fix issues, but it cuts off, it, it cuts off the, the, the food to it, right? It stops giving nutrients to the problem, right? We have to stop feeding it first, but then we usually have to do active things after that point to start working on those issues, right? So, but this is number one, right? That's why it's in the middle of the triangle, um, but we generally need some sort of training to solve the, or, you know, use of habitation charts and some sort of training to, to, completely, to completely solve the issues. Um, what, what I've done here too, is I also put, I, wrote, I put down examples of guidelines for high risk dogs. So, these were guidelines that I was given. I was given, I wrote these out for dogs that were in an animal shelter. 
that I gave to owners who were adopting older dogs that were in the shelter for a longer period of time, that had stronger personalities, um, that were high risk for, for issues. I'm not gonna read through these all in this lecture because they're here. You can you can go through them, but it just gives an idea. You can cut and paste and you could use this. You could, you could modify these. Now, this is for, you might read through this and be like, oh, this seems pretty extreme, all right? But I always liked to start off a little more extreme and um, and then you can always loosen up as needed, you know, for the case, you know, case by case. So to give you an example, those guidelines that I've written down on that page is I would use them in conjunction for our shelter dogs, um, where if there were dogs in a shelter and they were living inside of a kennel and they were there for a long time, they couldn't get adopted. I would train volunteers how to bring these dogs into what I call the transition room, right? where they just practiced, where the dog got practiced interacting with people with the right relationship. Because they're in the kennels all the time with their own toys, their own food, their everything, where they just went into a room and there was a couch there and the volunteer sat on the couch. The volunteer worked on training the dog to lay on a comfortable bed. The volunteer worked on allowing the dog to chew a bone um, on their bed. Um, if a volunteer wanted to, if they had their own snacks, they can eat their lunch up over there. It didn't, it didn't matter, right? Um, then taking out a toy, playing with the dog, putting the toy back, letting the dog rest, doing a training session, calling the dog over, giving the dog affection when it was doing the right thing. In contrast to what, nor what, a, what do volunteers normally do when they just come to help out shelter dogs they feel bad for, right? They take the dog for a walk and then they just sit on the floor and they give the dog love and, and they just, they're not really gonna be structured about it. So so often, even like with shelter dogs, you take the dog out and you give them struck, you know, structured interaction where they're provided for and they're happy. And then even the volunteer get, has some fun with the dog and gets the affection and does some training and everything like that. You set, you help set the stage for the adoption too, for example, where then you give, the owner's guidelines and um, and then they can follow through with with those guidelines at home and those dogs have a much better chance of sticking inside of the home compared to when someone adopts this five-year-old Rottweiler cross German Shepherd cross and right away lets it just lay on the couch and just pets it and it's all over them they're much more likely to have issues when the guests come over after that honeymoon period is over and the dog's like oh this is how it is right and now the guest come over and wants to sit next to their owner in the dog spot and the the the, the dog the dog the 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 guest is getting all the attention where the dog was used to getting all the attention now we get the dog barking being you know getting upset maybe showing aggression towards the visitor, seeing the visitor as a competitor. The owner tries to tell the dog no, but there's been no sense of leadership or who's really in charge. And that's kind of how things happen, right? That's how everything goes, goes you know, spirals, spirals downward, right? And it's just a story that everyone's gonna really hear. But um, in closing, understand leadership and Come up with your scripts, come up with your plans of how you're gonna teach leadership. Teaching leadership should happen very, very early on um, in the training process. For me, it was always the heart of most consultations. Most consultations, depending on how you wanna do it, how much time you're charging for, how much information you get ahead of, ahead of time, is most consultations, usually you're gathering information, um, and a lot of that gathering the information is not only to understand what the chief complaints are and desires of the owner is through your questions, you're getting a feel for that relationship. You know, who's leading the relationship, who has control, um, how easy it going to be to train this dog? You know, are they, is the stage set? And usually it's not, or there's almost always room for improvement and you're often, sitting down you know that's one of the first things you go over with the owners whether you you whether you used a questionnaire before you took the client 
or you got the information as you're sitting there. I used to like to take the information live because then if I asked a question and then I wanted to dig into it more, I could dig more into it. So, so it was usually my consultations where gathering information and usually going over some leadership and then telling them what good news this is that there's obviously so much room for improvement and it's gonna be so much easier to train the dog and it's gonna take a load off of the dog's back and, it's, and you're gonna enjoy the training and you hype them up and you might give them a couple of easy things, you know, easy things to do to get ready for the next lesson or some video instruction to prep them for the, for the, for the next lesson and everyone's excited, and everyone's happy and you're, you were not sitting there telling them what a jerk their dog is and we're gonna fix that dog and all that kind of stuff and we're not telling the owners what bad owners that they were, all right? Remember what it's all about, trainers, all right? That's what it's about. So in closing, Leadership is important, all right? Leadership is leadership is really about making the decisions for the group. It includes um, coaching the owners about dominance, all right, which is controlling the limited resources. I usually, the word dominance is so confusing nowadays to the average person. I usually just mostly talk about leadership and, you know, and mention dominance within there, but I classify it as leadership. If you're kind of making your own little charts, I just, I use the word leadership over there, but leadership and dominance go hand in hand. All right. Um, and be sure to understand what's out the misconceptions that the owners have out there um, between the two extremes. It is not about just being the boss and being first, but at the same time, it is important. It is a real thing. So just because there's a lot of bad information about it does not mean that it's not important or, not, or it's not a real thing, right? We just, they need a professional to show them how to do it the right way. Um, understand how to teach it. I suggest doing a chart, do an interactive chart with them. Talk, talk your way through it. Keep it lighthearted. Don't have them, don't make them feel bad for anything or make them feel like their dog was a jerk for anything that it did. And um, I gave you some sample guidelines for more extreme cases, but you can be creative and add your own salt and pepper to it. All right. Um, if, uh, let's see, let's see if there are any more questions over here. Um, Art says in one of the 4.0 vids, Mike has a video of more than one vid regarding a dominant secure dog attacking owner in the house pretty pretty horrific yeah and, and um or it also says i tell people i talk to that leadership and communication or our corollaries of each other good leadership and good communication go hand in hand both are essential to have a really good relationship with the dog yeah and and on that note art i'm going to end it is leadership is to improve the relationship right it really is it's about good pet parenting all right it's about providing if you provide for your dog and you do it the right way and they don't have to ask it's a win-win for everyone right it's not at all at all about being rough or tough or intimidating any more than a good parent or a good leader anywhere has to be right so i will be back on wednesday for our Q&A and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their, their week.